Hello everyone, my name is Ute Henschel Humaida and I am a marine biologist and today we want to talk about the deep sea. Till recently the deep sea was thought to be an inhospitable and thus barren habitat, a lifeless desert covering much of our globe. We now know that this is not true. Not only is the deep sea populated by a huge diversity of organisms, they also harbor some of the most bizarre and exotic ecosystems on Earth. Locked in these dark depths could be clues that will help us understand the way our own life works. For us landlocked organisms, it is difficult to imagine an environment of the deep sea. We experience strong cycles of light and dark, cold and warmth, rain and dryness. Now try to imagine an environment without any light, with pressures of hundreds of atmospheres, a consistent cold, and where every so often a morsel of food falls down from the ocean surface. This is the world that deep sea creatures have adapted to, and they have had millions of years to evolve to the best solutions. One such example as to how animals have adapted to this extreme environment is color. Most animals of the deep will lack color. They may be transparent, as some of the jellies, or they may be fully black, and are such perfectly concealed from their predators. Feeding. Feeding is important in the deep sea because food is ever so scarce. The carnivorous sponge chondrocladia is one prime example. While most shallow water sponges feed by filter feeding, where they pick up plankton from the seawater that they draw in for digestion. Plankton is essentially absent in the deep sea. Now this, this little sponge chondrocladia <coughs> has turned into a carnivorous lifestyle. It has tree-like branches with sharp spikes that it uses to impale swimming prey. Another good example is the anglerfish. This is rather a small animal, about the size of a coin. However, it has, by comparison, a very big mouth. Not only that, it contains a bioluminescent bulb that it uses to attract potential prey, which is then consumed in one big gulp. Bioluminescence, in fact, does play a big role in the deep, dark ocean. It is used by jellies, squid, fish, and also by microorganisms to communicate with one another in the complete darkness. Chemicals, such as luciferin and an enzyme by the name of luciferase are used to produce together and in the presence of oxygen light. Now in terms of reproduction just try to imagine how difficult it will be to find a mate in the vast depths of the dark ocean. It would be an almost impossible endeavor. How do they manage? Again the anglerfish provides a striking example. The male which is much smaller than the female, attaches himself permanently to the female body. Even the blood vessels will fuse, never to be separated again. So another example of deep sea organisms is its larger size in comparison to their shallow water counterparts, a phenomenon called gigantism. Examples that we've heard about are gigantic squid, which can be up to 14 meters in length, that would be the size of a bus or shrimps, um, the size of your dinner plate. Normally they are the size of, of uh, one to two um, centimeters. And we've also learned about gigantic octopus, which can get three meters in size. Big size is thought to reflect the slow lifestyle in the deep sea, which relates directly to the next topic, longevity. Many organisms of the deep will live for years, decades, and even for centuries. Among the longest living organisms ever recorded are deep sea corals. Estimates from coral colonies offshore, offshore Hawaii suggest that these are over 4,000 years old, which is older than the Egyptian pyramids. However, modern day instrument, instrumentation such as deep water trawling and longline fishing are destroying these elusive communities. Since these communities grow ever so slowly, it will take them that much longer to recover. Until relatively recently, it was textbook knowledge that all life uh, relies on the sun for primary energy. That was until the discovery of the rich communities at hydrothermal vents, 
home to some of the most productive ecosystems on Earth. These vents are found almost everywhere where tectonic plates are moving away from each other, forming new ocean crust. Water heated up to 400 degrees upon contact with the molten magma will spew into the deep sea. This is a cocktail of minerals, it's toxic, it contains a lot of sulfides that precipitate rapidly upon contact with the cold seawater. This, in turn, will lead to the formation of large chimney-like structures, termed black or white smokers, depending on the color of the plume. These smokers, iconic pictures of the deep sea, provide a unique habitat for animals and microbes alike. But how do they manage? The answer is chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis is a mode of growth in which carbon dioxide is the exclusive source of assimilated carbon. And the energy for growth is provided by chemosynthetic processes rather than light. This pe peculiar metabolic lifestyle is limited to microorganisms, such as bacteria and archaea, and it forms the basis of the entire hydrothermal vent ecosystem. Now, the true evolutionary innovation is that certain animals have evolved to establish a symbiosis with chemosynthetic bacteria. And, and in consequence, a very unique hydrothermal vent fauna has formed. Most notable is the giant tube worm Riftia parheptila. Up to two meters in height, this worm lacks entirely a digestive tract. Riftia has learned to harness the power of chemosynthetic bacteria that are integrated into a large internal sac termed trophosome. The symbionts use hydrogen sulfide as an energy source to convert carbon dioxide to sugars. The worm's blood picks up and delivers sulfide, carbon dioxide, nitrate and oxygen to these bacterial symbionts, which in turn feed the host with excess sugars. But there is more. Gigantic clamps and muscles containing chemosynthetic bacteria intracellularly within their gills. These clamps line up along the vent fissures, thus providing a constant flow of nutrients to their bacterial helpers. Then there are Pompeii worms. They have hairy backs, and these hairs are actually colonies of bacteria. These worms are frequently found wrapping themselves around the thermoprobe and are found to sit in the most hot vent fluids are among the most thermotolerant animals known. The thymbions on the other side are thought to provide the worm with a type of insulation and with a mechanism to, to detoxify the vent fluids. Now moving up in the tropic, trophic levels, another group of organisms feeds on these described bivalves and worms. For example, crabs are constantly found to nibble on the riftia plumes and fish and octopuses will feed on crabs and other small crustaceans. Undoubtedly, even after four decades of intensive research effort, much remains to be discovered about the hydrothermal vent ecosystems. Here, today, we have learned that the principle of symbiosis is instrumental for the formation of the richest ecosystems on our planet. The potential of the deep sea for bioprospecting and the need to protect this habitat have now been recognized. Human threats for the deep sea are waste disposal, radioactive and otherwise, deep sea fishing, deep ocean drilling, and climate change. Because we know so little about the deep sea, this ecosystem may well be substantially modified by human activity before we fully and truly understand its natural state. Coming to the summary, <clears throat> in this lecture we have discussed the deep sea ecosystem where life is dictated by eternal cold, darkness, high pressure and a scarcity of food. And we have learned about the adaptations of animals to this unique habitat. We have further talked about hydrothermal vent ecosystems home to some of the richest communities of life on this planet. Higher life at vent sites is built upon symbiosis between animals and chemosynthetic microbes. Thirdly, even we know so little about the deep sea, it has already become clear that this environment needs protection.